here he is talking about the New Testament. Thou shalt not kill. Uh-uh. Don't kill him in your heart. Don't murder him in your heart. Don't, don't kill him in your heart. Don't, don't get mad enough to know. And then guess what? Don't kill him with your mouth. Don't kill him with your mouth. You see the minimum and the maximum there? The law was the minimum. He said, watch your mouth. You can't say anything to anybody. I was mad, God. I don't care if you was mad. Be angry and sin not. That's the new covenant. We walk around here, black folk. I tell them off in a second. But that ain't a Bible. The higher calling of the new covenant is, amen. Yeah, I could tell them off. Yeah, I could let them ruin my day. But I'm going to take down. And I'm going to let it roll off my back. Huh? Huh? And I'm not going to do it because of them. I'm going to do it because of him. All right? Because he done took some things that I done did. And he done let it roll off of his back. So let's look at Leviticus 27 and 30. The Bible says, And all the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's. It is holy unto the Lord. And if a man will at all redeem aught of his tithes, all right, he shall add thereto the fit part thereof. He's saying that if a situation happened where you know what you got to give to the Lord, but you go ahead and you spend your tithe because there's some type of emergency, he said, that's cool. He said, but you're going to come back and pay the Lord the tithe, and you're going to add a fit part. All right? It's like the Lord said, okay, you can spend my tithe. He said, but I'm going to charge interest on my tithe. <laughs> he said, you're going to have to give me 20%. You're going to add a fit part of that. All right. So if it was, if it was, if it was, let's say, let's say, all right, if it was, if it was a hundred dollar you made, you tied ten, you say, oh, something came up, I spun my ten, all right, but I don't want to forget you, Lord. You got to add twenty percent to that ten, Amen. which would be twenty on the ten, so it'd be like two dollars, so you'd pay twelve dollars instead of the ten dollars. You see how meticulous the Lord is. Now don't y'all run out of here, Lord, okay, I'm a, oh, yeah, I'm a Lord. Don't, don't y'all run out of here and do that. Because that's not what he's trying to get us to. He's just trying to show how much of it really belongs to him. All right? All right? Look what he says, and that's what the verse means. 32, and concerning the tide of the herd or the flock, even whatsoever passing under the rod, the tent shall be holy unto the Lord. He shall not search whether it be good or bad, neither shall he change it. And if he change it at all, then both it and the change thereof shall be holy. It shall not be redeemed. Don't give the Lord the worst of your sheep. Give him the best of it. Don't change it, he's saying. 34, these are the commandments which the Lord commanded Moses from the children of Israel in Mount Sinai. God, we thank you for your word. We pray you bless it. We pray you increase us. We pray you teach us so much about ourselves about our souls, and about your kingdom today. We pray, God, that your kingdom would come. Your will would be done on earth as it is in heaven, God. Show us how you want your church to look. And we just thank you for it even now. In Yahshua, Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, amen. Come on, give them a shout of praise. Hallelujah. All right, we're going to try to move as fast as we can. And so take good notes, take pictures, amen, because I got a lot I want to get to, amen. But we're going in, all right? So uh, we've been talking about the New Testament engines of blessings. We talked about prayer, we talked about fasting, and we talked about giving. In this church, we often talk about prayer, we often talk about fasting, but we rarely ever talk about giving, all right? Uh, but uh, we're going to change that up a little bit, amen, because your people can't be blessed unless they know how to give. Come on, give y'all some praise, amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. And so whenever you want blessings or rewards from the Most High God, get yourself in position. Uh, you should be praying, fasting, or giving. Uh, we said that we would talk about giving because the Bible is replete with scriptures about giving, about finances, uh, for instance, there are 500 verses about prayer and faith, but there are over 2,000 verses about finances, about money that's in the Bible. We normally stay away from money in the church because of the haters, uh, uh, but um, we're just not going to care about the haters in 2024. <laughs> Hallelujah. We're going to preach the whole counsel of God because they're going to talk about us anyway. Yeah, so it don't matter. The ones that's here and that's members know 
that, that, that like a money-hungry church couldn't be further from the truth what we about. We are about and have been about and always will be about the souls of men coming to the cross of Calvary. That's what it's all about. That's what it's all about. Amen. And we're going we to discern and understand that as we fall in line with the right way church is supposed to be, and the right way people are supposed to be given, that you can actually save more souls for God because you can get yourself in more places. You can buy more airtime, more radio time. You can put out more books. Amen. You could be a juggernaut on earth for the souls of men. All right. And I'm going to show you that we're watching other major institutions operating in the money that the church should be operating in. Did you hear what I'm talking about? Other institutions operating in the money that the church should be operating in. And because of that, they putting their message out. But nobody hearing the message of Jesus Christ and him crucified. Come on, give y'all some praise up in him. All right? All right, because that's what it's all about. And so we talked about the tithe, what it is. It's 10%. We talked about who ordained it. It wasn't from the church. It wasn't Pastor Omar. It wasn't First Lady. It was God that even created the word tithe. He created how to do it. He, he told us that, that that's what he wanted us to do. And a lot of people get mad about the tithe. But hallelujah, don't get mad at the church or the preacher. If you're going to be mad, get mad at God because he was the one invented the tithe. It was him. It wasn't us. And the tithe is his vehicle, his mechanism on how he wants to fund his church. Because a lot of people come back and they say, well, listen, y'all just, God going to take care of his church if y'all real. Just, just let God take care of it. But the way he told us to take care of it is the tithe. And I'm going to show you that God's people have an awesome opportunity. Because God could take care of everything himself. But what God wants is what's called a partnership with us. He wants a partnership. You know what I'm saying? And it's amazing. You know, if I had to take you into the realm of business and show you an individual that's making the money, they don't need you at all. They don't need you at all. They're making trillions of dollars. But they come to you and they say, listen, I don't need you, but I want to bless you. And I'm looking for a partner. Not because I want to, uh, 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 not because I need you, but because, hallelujah, I want to see you blessed. So I'm going to open up an opportunity for you to partner with me in this great work that I'm about to do. And that's what God has done. That's what God has done. He don't need us at all for anything. The Bible says if he was hungry, he wouldn't tell us. If God wanted to do all the work himself, he could save everybody on the earth by himself. But what we learn in seminary is that God formed a cooperative agreement with man. He said, I got a work to do, but I want you to help me get it done. And so what it is, is, is that he's not here, corporeal, in the physical, but we are his hands and his feet. He do the work through us, and tithing is no difference. He funds the church through us. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills, but he does it through us. And he does it that way so that when we get to glory, amen, our work's going to follow us up there with him. Come on, give y'all some praise, amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. The tithe, he, he ordained it. It's, it's also called a first fruits. And what we also saw is that it belongs to the Lord. It's his. It's not ours. And when we take that 10% and spend it on what we got to spend it on, Malachi says that we're actually robbing God. It says, shall a man rob God? Because what thievery and robbing is, is when you touch something that actually don't belong to you. The 10% is his. And for so long as the Hebrews, we've been stealing from him. For so long as the Hebrews, amen, we've been takers. All we want to do is eat, and we want to eat for free. All right? We have forgotten how to pay our way. Huh? Huh? Our, 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 our exile in America has made us uh, 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 have a condition called entitlement. We want what we want, and we want it for free. But that's not how our relationship with God has been. The Hebrews have always paid their way. They have always, amen, supplied. And we'll find it, we'll see it in a second. They've always supplied 
amen, uh, uh, the church, the synagogue with what it needs so that God's work can be done, all right? And JFK would come out, amen, and I gave this speech at my, at my high school graduation, amen. I was one of the speakers at the high school graduation when JFK said, ask not what your country can do for you, but ask what you can do for your country. And I want to bring that spiritual. It's time, Hebrews, take us, entitlement people, to stop asking what your church can do for you and start asking what you can do for the church. Are you hearing me up in here? It's a mindset, it's, it's, a, it's a flip, amen, and it's a flip that we're doing as a ministry, amen. And so we talked about the tithe, we talked about it belongs to the Lord. And then we went into how it predates the law. Pastor, what you're talking about? Well, so many people don't tithe because they think it's part of the Mosaic Levitical law. huh? It is a part of the law, and we'll see in a second, but it also predates the law. It was there before Moses was ever born, some 430 years, amen? Uh, 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 we see, uh, 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 first off, Cain and Abel. Cain uh, gave the firstlings. We see 430 years before the law, Abraham tied to Melchizedek. And then we see, uh, last time, Jacob at Bethel made a vow unto God, Deacon Carl. Listen, if you're, going, if you're real, if you really going to be my God, and if you're really going to bless me and feed me, then I vow to give you 10%. I vow to give you 10%. And when he made that vow, one thing about making a vow with God, God going to always keep his end. All right? We saw Jacob come back across that Jordan. He left there with just a staff. He come back with two bands of men, two companies of men, two whole groups of men made up of servants, amen, employees, amen, cattle, sheep, camels. He came back loaded. And all, he, all it was was he made a promise to tie it to God. Huh? And God kept his end of the bargain. I wonder how many people left here last Sunday and said, God, it's time for me to make a vow to you. I'm tired of being broke. I'm tired of being on the bottom end of this thing. That's not your will for my life. And I am your, he didn't move on Hannah for her to give birth to. Until you get real with your God and tell your God, God, if you break through for me, this is what I'm going to do for you. Huh? I'm going to tithe. Huh? I'm a, some people are going to raise it up. God, I'm not going to give 10. I'm going to give 15. I'm not going to give 15. I'm going to give 20, God, if you break through for me. All right? And for some, that's what God was waiting on, and the breakthrough is on the way. Come on, give y'all some praise up in here. <laughs> Hallelujah. You discern it in the spiritual. Now, listen, this morning we're going to move on, and we're going to talk about how grace is always greater. How grace is always greater. And we're going to have three points, amen, uh, this morning. We're going to talk about the minimum. Uh, uh, number two, New Testament examples. Amen. And then we're going to talk about Paul's principles. And like I said, I'm going to try to be move. I'm going to try to move a little fast so we can get through it all and get y'all out in a timely fashion. But let's talk about our first point, the minimum, the minimum. We observe, y'all, that the tithe predates the law. We, we know that this is true. But we must also acknowledge that Moses made it a part of the law. It predates it, but then Moses took it under the, under the auspices of God, and he made it a part of the law. It's in that. It's in that. In fact, our scripture in Leviticus, which is, which is the, the Levitical laws, is, is uh, the tithe belongs. This is important. Because when we come to the law, the new covenant we are part of, grace is always greater than the law. Grace is always greater than the law. Compared to grace, the law is the minimum the Hebrews. And they want to go back to the Ten Commandments. They want to go back to the Levitical laws. What they don't understand is, is that that law is the minimum. It's not living at the minimum. Hallelujah. God done took, the, took us in. He's going to tell us. He told uh, uh, his, his, his disciples his, of the scribes and the Pharisees, who are part of the Old Covenant, Old Kingdom, of heaven. Now, let me break this down for us. See the righteousness of the old covenant and uh, scribes and Pharisees, meaning that they wore the right garments, just as ratchet, just as sinful. Huh? But they was doing everything on the outside. They were walking the center. Uh, uh, ye, ye who something on the outside that they wasn't on the stone, the old covenant. But the new covenant, new covenant, he would take his law. He wouldn't change us from the outside of crying about the things that you done did. You could be by yourself. 
By yourself crying about the things you done said, the things you done did, amen. People think you tripping. What's wrong with you? Why, why are you so hard on yourself? Uh-uh, it ain't me hard on myself. It's the God in me that's hard on myself. Huh? Because something done happened on the inside. And so the righteousness was different. That's why Jesus would look at the Pharisees and the scribes. He said, y'all like whitewashed tombs. He said, y'all look clean and white and pure on the outside. But on the inside, you're full of dead men's bones. You understand what I'm saying? And that's all those that try to live by the law, even today. Even our Hebrew brothers, amen, that, that find out we're Hebrews and they go back to the law. When you really get to know them, amen, there's no real salvation experience. There's no real born again experience. They still running the rim, women, they still cursing, they still won't fight everybody. There's no love there. Why? Because the law of God is not written in their hearts, it's written outside on their hands. That's the difference between the new covenant and the old covenant. You see what I'm saying? He said, your righteousness got to exceed the scribes and the Pharisees. Two ways it was going to exceed the, the, the uh, scribes and Pharisees' righteousness. It's going to exceed their righteousness in the new covenant positionally and practically. Positionally and practically. All right? And I'm going to say it quickly, just quickly, just quickly. In the new covenant, our righteousness is better than the old covenant scribes and Pharisees because we are one, positionally righteous in Christ. What does that mean? When we get saved, when we admit we sinners, and when we believe in Yahshua Jesus Christ as the perfect sacrifice, the propitiation for our sins, when we believe that he is the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world, when we call upon him, while he may be found, anybody hear me up in here? The Bible says, though our sins be red as scarlet, he will wash them white as snow. He tells us that he's going to take our sins, amen, and cast them in the sea of what? Forgetfulness. He's going to take our sins, amen, and cast them as far from us as the east is to the west. Anybody hear me up in here? On judgment day, hallelujah, he's going to write our name in the Lamb's book of life. Amen. And everything that we've done won't ever come back on our account because it's under the blood. Anybody excited? Hallelujah. That right there is called positional righteousness. It's when God changes your place, hallelujah, in eternity. You born in sin. You born in Adam's lineage. You born, hallelujah, to die for the wages of sin is death. But when you accept Christ, he changes your position. Hey, you've been translated out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light, into the kingdom of his dear son. That's why the Bible says there's not only one Adam, there's two Adams. And you get to choose which Adam you want to be under. You can be under the Adam who fell, or you can be under the Adam who succeeded. Anybody hear me up in here? So when we believe in Christ, when we accept the gospel, he takes us and changes our position. We are now in Christos and not in the first fallen Adam. We are now in righteousness. We are now in eternal life. <laughs> we are now in the blessings of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Anybody hear me up in here? We are positionally righteous. In Christos. Huh? When God looks at us, when we change our position, huh, he don't see Montgomery no more. He don't see uh, 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 Minister Sam no more. He don't, see, he don't see Deacon Montgomery, Deacon John. When he look at our lives, he sees Jesus. He sees the righteousness of Christ that's been imputed on us. So when he says your righteousness got to exceed the Pharisees, we accomplish that. Because when we get saved, we, not, we no longer have our own righteousness. We have the righteousness of Christ. Come on, give God some praise. Up in here. That's the gospel, friends. That's the gospel. That's what it means to be saved when you accept him. He, don't, he gives you his righteousness. So secondly, our righteousness is going to uh, uh, exceed the Pharisees' righteousness by, by what we call practical righteousness. So when you get saved, you receive positional righteousness the moment you get saved. But this practical righteousness is our everyday living. All right? It's a walking it out. Huh? And no, we ain't going to play no music, walk it out up in here. But, <laughs> but <laughs> and I ain't judging nobody, but I'm just saying. All right. All right. So, oh, God. 
So, so we talk about a practical righteousness. Because a lot of people don't understand one or the other. Yeah, you get saved and now you're righteous in Christ, but there's also a walking it out you gotta do. All right, don't you jam up in here. Just keep it, keep it low, keep it low. <laughs> keep it low. There's a walking it out you gotta do. I keep going back to that, huh? It's an everyday living you gotta do, amen? And uh, our righteousness is going to exceed those that's under the law. Hallelujah, on, that, on those grounds as well. Why? Because the moment we get saved, amen, hallelujah, we are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. We no longer by ourselves. He comes inside, amen, and he, he makes his abode, his, his life with us. And that's why people, when they leave the altar, listen, they don't know what happened, but something done changed. Something done changed. Something done changed. I thought I was just coming here because I lost a bet, but something done changed. <laughs> I'm not the same no more, and I can't do what I used to do, and I can't say what I used to say. And I was coming here only once, but I found myself back here the next weekend, and I just like, Lord, what done happened? You've been born again. Not a flesh, born again of the spirit. You've been born again, not born like earth birthday, no, born again, heavenly birthday. You've been saved, you've been changed. And when you're born again, you can't walk in darkness like you used to walk in darkness. You not only have a positional righteousness, but the spirit in you is going to begin to demand that you live out a practical righteousness. If any man be in Christ, he's a what? A new creature. Old things are passed away. All things have become what? New. That's what it's all about. And our righteousness exceed those that stuck in the law. Amen? Because we got the spirit of the living God living in us. Huh? And I'm going to show you for a second that the law would say this. But with the Holy Ghost, God take it up another level. The law was only the minimum. It was the minimum. It was the minimum. It was a shadow of what God really wanted from us. And the funny thing about it, we couldn't even fulfill the minimum without him. But with him, who we can do the maximum. Come on, give y'all some praise, amen? Okay, pastor, break it down, break it down. All right, you done broke that down, all right. Let's go to it now, let's go to it. Let's look at it. In Matthew 20, Matthew 5, watch this, and, and, and 21, the old law. You have heard that it was said by, by them of old, thou shalt not kill. And whoever shall kill shall be in danger of judgment. That's the law. You know the, the, the Ten Commandments? Thou shalt not kill. The minimum. The minimum. But in the New Covenant, watch this, 22. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry. Don't even get mad like that. God is saying, listen, I, you, 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 you could wait for him at the house with the knife. He, but in, in the Old Testament, that was all right. Well, at least I didn't kill him, Lord. <laughs> I beat him close to it, but at least I didn't kill him. I left him with a pause. <laughs> All right? The minimum. But us in the New Testament, don't even get angry. Don't even get mad like that. And when we get mad like that, you understand what I'm saying? When we get mad like that, hallelujah, we feel something in us that say, now you know you was wrong for getting mad like that. Over that fried chicken that's cold, you know you were mad. <laughs> You're wrong for that. And not only that, look what he said. You see, minimum, maximum. Then he said, and whosoever shall say to his brother. So it's not only he don't want us to get mad like that, thou shalt not kill, the minimum. Don't get mad like that. And don't say certain things. Because he's going to get into a shall say rocker, which was kind of like a, a bad word in the, in the Bible days. We ain't got to say no bad words. Y'all know all the bad words there are. And here he is talking about the, the New Testament. I don't even want you to, listen, thou shalt not kill. Uh-uh, uh-uh. Don't kill him in your heart. Don't murder him in your heart. Don't, don't kill him in your heart. Don't, don't get mad enough to, no, no. And then guess what? Don't kill him with your mouth. Don't kill him with your mouth. You see the minimum and the maximum there? Huh? The law was the minimum. He said, watch your mouth. You can't say anything to anybody. I was mad, God. I don't care if you was mad. 
be angry, and sin not. That's the new covenant. We walk around here, black folk, I tell them off in a second. But that ain't a Bible. That ain't a Bible. The higher calling of the new covenant is, amen, yeah, I could tell them off. Yeah, I could let them ruin my day. Huh? But I'm going to take down, and I'm going to let it roll off my back. Huh? Huh? And I'm not going to do it because of them. I'm going to do it because of him. All right? Because he done took some things that I done did, and he done let it roll off of his back. You see? You see? You see? All right, I got a few claps out of that. Because some of y'all won't go back to the law. You won't go back to the minimum. I didn't kill him, Lord. But did you slam them and talk about them? Did you cuss them out before you left? Pull out a Kentucky Fried Chicken. Huh? Huh? And how angry did you get? Because that's the new covenant. That's where we're going with this thing. That's where God want to know. Because God, listen, he looking at our hearts, y'all. He looking at our hearts, man. Don't come here with that low level back to the lost stuff. That's low level. That's entry level. The new covenant is greater. The minimum. Look, listen, listen, let's go, let's go on some more. Matthew 5, 27. Hallelujah. You have heard that it was said by them of old time, thou shalt not commit adultery. The law. Don't you be with nobody that's not your husband. And don't be with nobody that's not your wife. All right? Thou shalt not do what? Commit adultery. That's the minimum, though. Watch what he do in the new covenant. With the spirit of living God in us. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her. Now listen, we're going, we going, we going. It ain't just the men looking at women. Because some of y'all women's looking at men's too. We got some tigers out there. <laughs> so we're going to make the word apply both ways this morning up in here. But you see the minimum? Don't sleep with them. And you pulling the Bill Clinton. I didn't hear you. Know, I didn't do it. I didn't do it. I didn't go all the way. I didn't. I didn't. Because you just won't just slip out the law. But the law was the minimum. And so what Jesus said in the new covenant, listen, you ain't got to lay with her to offend me. You just got to be looking at her like you want to lay with her. You just got to, when she pass you, mm, hmm. <laughs> you done peel her like a banana when she pass. You done. <laughs> and to God, that's enough in the new covenant. He said, I don't want you even looking like that. Because just because you didn't do the act, but I'm looking at what's in you. Because this is what's in your heart that comes. See, not all the time situations and circumstances lead to you being able to fulfill the desire. But God knew if the desire is in there, if the right circumstances were to align and happen, then that deed is as good as done. And so that's why he say, hallelujah, get yourself in a new covenant mind frame. Well, you're not only watching what you do, but you're watching what you think. You're watching your motives of your heart. And you're trying to get yourself to a level of righteousness where the Holy Spirit is convicting you, amen, of looking at somebody the wrong way. Now, for the man of God, listen, the sin is not seeing. Because then you'd have to duct tape your eyes everywhere you go. <laughs> Pull that off at night, you'd have no eyebrows, no eyelashes. <laughs> I'm back, honey. And lust. Because in the world we live in, you're going to see some stuff. <laughs> Baby. Whether you want to see it or not, you're like, oh, God, what happened? Jesus, where am I? <laughs> All right? When it's, the, it's, it's, whoo, it's that second long look. It's that, it's, it's, like, like this, like this, okay, you good. But it's that. <laughs> 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 
Y'all see what I'm talking about? All right, all right, all right, all right. Talking about the minimum, the law, and this new covenant grace, all right? And I think you get it. It's all over the place. Matthew 5, 43. Listen, the old law, you have heard been said that thou shalt love thy neighbor, hate thy enemy. That was it in the Old Testament. He just said, love your neighbor. That's all God, God said. So, so, the, so the Hebrews took it, well, if you say love my neighbor, well, I got to hate my enemy. All right? That's what the Hebrews did. But he come, that was the minimum, loving your neighbor. But he come in a new covenant, but I say unto you, love your enemies. Minimum, maximum. You see? The covenant of grace is always greater than the law. So to God, the law was the minimum. Everything that was in it was the minimum. And remember, though the tithe predated the law, it still was a part of the law. What I'm telling you is, is that the tithe, as part of the law, is only the minimum two. Thank you, minister. I got a couple of claps. It's the minimum. Us giving 10% is the minimum. Huh? And we look at that, ooh, that's a lot. No, 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 wait. Wait, that's, that's just the minimum. You see, it's the least you can do for God. Because of all he's done for you. You understand what I'm saying? Now, I'm going to teach y'all something else. Amen. Hallelujah. You see, the tithe is just the start. There's something else in the scripture after the tithe. That's called an offering. All right? That's why you usually see it together. It's called tithes and what? An offering. And, and I just want to educate you that the offering is anything that you give above the tithe. You come in, you give your 10%, hallelujah, and then you say, man, God's been good to me this week. I want to throw him something extra. That's called the offering. Now, I won't take it this far, but some theologians, some people say that giving don't really start until you give an offering. Because they say the tithe wasn't yours to begin with. I don't, I don't take it that far. You know what I'm saying? I'd just be happy if y'all tired, but, but, but I, let's, just, let's just bring it to where it is, that that's the minimum. Some theologians, some preachers say that, that tithing ain't given, it's returning. That's why people say paying your tithes. Because you're just giving God what you owe him. Some people say that the giving starts in offerings. In offerings. Now, I know it's hard, but like some people say, it's tight, but it's right. You understand what I'm saying? When Malachi 3.8 came through, hallelujah, it said, will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me, but you say, wherein have we robbed you? Look what it says. In times and... Where did offerings came from? <laughs> Pastor, you put that in there? Uh-uh. Uh-uh. That's been there. Now, first things first, we want to get you right on the tithe. But we got some that's right on the tithe already. Huh? But understand that the tithe is just, like the first point say, is just the minimum. Robin Morris says this. He says, the tithe returns the Lord his portion, that 10%. When you return the Lord his portion, that causes the other 90% to be blessed. All right? You could either have 100% that's not blessed, or if you're tired, have 90% that's blessed. I don't know about you, I'd rather have a 90 that's blessed than a 100 that's not blessed. All right? All right? He says, but the offering is where the real multiplication takes place. Is where the real multiplication takes place. Pastor, what you're saying? Tithe is not Hallelujah, it predates, it's always greater. So the tithe is just, hallelujah, the minimum that we should be doing. Let's look at our second point. Let's look at some New Testament examples of giving. Let's look at some New Testament examples of giving. All right? I won't show it to you. Let me show you uh, the first one. Let's look at Mary in John chapter 12. All right? In John 12. 
In John 12, it says, Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, which had been dead. It's right after he raised Lazarus from the grave. All right? Uh, there they made him a supper, and Martha served, as always. But Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. Then took Mary, watch this, a pound of ointment, of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. Right here we have Mary, hallelujah, pouring the ointment on Yahshua. Some people say it's the same event as the alabaster box. Other people say it's not. Amen. You can decide. But what we do know is that, that ointment that Mary put upon Jesus was worth a year's worth of wages. It was a year's worth of wages. What does that mean? Well, the average person in America makes about $59,000 a year, all right? Now, since we're in Louisiana, <laughs> that average is lower, all right? So the average Louisianian makes around 50 a year, probably about 10 less than the national average, all right? Makes about 50 a year. Mary gives an ounce, huh? Could you imagine yourself walking in church and giving $50,000 to the Most High God and his work? All right. Now, we got some in here, they down with it. They're like, yeah, I'm going to be I'm gonna be that one. I'm going to be that ninja that do it. I'm, I'm coming in with it. All right. You got some others saying, $50,000. Oh, no. Woo. Oh, no. All right. All right. We're still working on you. We're still praying for you. But let's, let's discover why would Mary spend 50000 on Jesus? Huh? All right, why would she spend 50000 on Jesus? Number one, because Jesus had changed her life. That's number one. He had changed her life. All right? Mary was on her way to death. Huh? Some people say that it's the same Mary that he was casting devils out of. Anybody hear me up in here? All right? He had saved her. You see? And there's a song about the alabaster box. It says, alabaster box, it says, you were there the night he found me. Huh? You weren't there when he put his loving arms around me. So I don't know about you and what he saved you from, but I could just think about me and what he saved me from. I could think about where he brought me out of and where I would be, Kent, if it had not been for the Lord that was on my side. And I asked myself, huh? Uh, because of that salvation, all that I have gained, and I ask myself, how much is that worth? Huh? It is priceless to me. It is priceless to me. It, it don't matter if you put a $10,000 price tag on that. No, no. It is priceless to me. You know? And so Mary come in there, and she give 50K. 50K. Because of the change that Yahshua did in her life. Come on, give y'all some praise up in here. Listen, I can't wait till somebody come in here with an understanding of how good God had been to them. I can't wait. And let me tell you, people been given, since these messages started, amen, people been getting blessed. And people been given, amen, large amounts, amen, hallelujah, and, and they only given large amounts because God's been passing out large amounts. I don't know. I, I got to tell you because you might miss. You got to know what's going on in the heavens. People giving six, seven, eight. Why? You only give six, seven, eight when he done bless you with 70,000, 80,000. You understand what I'm saying? But that's just the beginning. God want to do more for his people because he want to do more for his church. Anybody hear me up in here? And I imagine a day when somebody, Bartle, walk up in here with a $100,000 check. With a hundred, who would love to be that person that walk in here for the house of God with a $100,000 check? Kent, I already know you would do it. Kent, I done watch you do it already, Kent. I done watch you settle that case. Kent, come with a bag of money for past. You've been out there. But you done did that already. You done did it already. I done traveled with you to Baton Rouge to go get it. That's how much you, you remember that trip? You understand what I'm saying? 
But that's when you understand how good God has been to you. That's when you understand you should have been dead and gone. That's when you understand you should have been locked up. You see what I'm saying? I can't wait till somebody come with it like that. Come with it like that. And 100,000 just to start. You know what I'm praying for? I'm praying for some of y'all to come with a million. Look, just come up in here, look. Stay it on business. You gonna walk in here, Miss Mary, you gonna walk in here with your glasses and a suitcase. With our boys in the back of her, look. Million cash. Pastor, they, all they had was fives and tens. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, 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 hallelujah, in the name of Jesus. And I'm going to tell you, this was supposed to be happening in the church. You know where people giving their money like that to? They're giving their money to, to colleges and, and other, other good things. I was just reading that somebody dropped 100 million on Spelman University. And while I congratulated our HBCs, I began to look up, well, how much do universities in America get per year? It's estimated that the endowments for universities are two, let me see, let me get that right, hold on. Yo, I got to check my notes. Universities get $200 billion. 200 what? Billion dollars. I pause for a second. Because you know, we have forgotten what should come first. Because we're sitting here happy. Yeah, Spellman. Yeah, yeah, all. Uh, but when them children go to school and they sit in them classes, is that going to do anything for their eternal destination? So you're giving $200 billion huh, to educate somebody so they could be smarter in hell? So don't you dare be no fool like that when God bless you. You running down to UL, running down to LSU, you better run down to the church, the house of the living God. That's where you better run. You better put first things first, and you better find it. Listen, listen, you gotta, it, it can't be any church. It's got to be a church that's about the souls of men, that's preaching the gospel. Because that's what it's all about. It, 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 the money is not to, 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 to ball till you fall. The money is to get the gospel out, to do the work of Jesus, to seek and to save that which is lost. That's what the money is for. So that Atlanta could have a mega church, you understand what I'm saying? Built on the gospel. That's what the money is for. So it can change a city. So it can change a nation. I think we got our priorities messed up. I really do. I really do. I don't know how I got on that, but I'm just saying. <laughs> Mary gave him an offering worth 50K. 50K. And I, I, I'm putting it out there because I want to prepare you for what the Lord is about to do in your life. And when he drop it on you, I don't want you to doubt or say, man, what I got to do? No, 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 no. Because vision always come before provision. He never going to drop it on you without a plan. All right? And so your plan got to be to invest in the things of God first. Amen? Come on, give him glory in this place. I don't feel no kind of way about saying that. Because it's first things first. It's first things first. And it's about the souls of men. All right? Uh, so Mary gave him that because, listen, hallelujah, because he had changed Mary's life. But not only that, listen, he had raised Mary's brother from the grave. He did something for Mary that only God could do. And so above salvation, listen, he, listen, he had blessed us so. I don't know about you, but there's some in here that God done did some special things for Above salvation. Above salvation. 
doing some things for you that only he could do. That marriage that you shouldn't be in. Them children that you shouldn't have. That healing, eh, that the doctors couldn't give you. That healing of that loved one, like Mary, huh? That job that he gave you, that business that he gave you. He gave you that. Deuteronomy say, remember the Lord thy God, who giveth thee the power to get well. He gave you that well. And because of that, hallelujah, you're supposed to capitulate and act a certain way towards him. Don't you dare think that you done pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Oh, no. If it wasn't God, you wouldn't have what you have and you wouldn't be where you are. Woo! So Mary knew that. So she come through that with 50K. I just want to give the Lord the praise for what he's done, not only for me and changing my life, but the blessing he gave that only God could do. Let's move quicker here. In John 19, we see Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus collab to give an awesome offering. All right? Long story short, it says that, and after this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, besought Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him leave. Came therefore, took the body of Jesus, and there came also Nicodemus, which came uh, first by Jesus by night, and they brought a mixture of myrrh, aloes, about a hundred pound weight. What these brothers did, long story short, they gave Jesus at his death the funeral of a king. In Isaiah 53, it was just this, this mysterious passage where they say he would be numbered with transgressors, but he would be buried with the rich. And, and, and Old Testament theologians couldn't understand how he going to be uh, uh, numbered with criminals, but buried with the rich. And, 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 and Yahshua, that prophecy was fulfilled to the T because he was hung on that cross with thieves. And he was supposed to be thrown in the valley of Gehenna with the thieves and with the murderers, not even put dirt on. But hallelujah, Joseph of Arimathea begged Pilate to get the body of Jesus. Because Joseph and Nicodemus knew that he, even though he was, he was hung with the thieves, he wasn't a thief. He was actually a king, and he was the king of kings. So they come through that, and they bury him in a kingly sepulcher. The Bible says it was in a garden, and never a man laid in this sepulcher. It was brand new. Not only that, hallelujah, uh, Nicodemus come through that and got the best apothecary, the best myrrh, the best aloes, hallelujah. It's like they was giving him the frankincense myrrh that the, king, that, the, that the three wise men gave him in the beginning. They was blessing him on the back end the same way. Anybody hear me up in here? All right, hallelujah. Some scholars say when you take Jesus' funeral and look at the sepulcher and all the hundred pounds of myrrh and aloes that they gave Jesus a funeral that was worth $500,000. It was the funeral of a king. It was the offering for a king. Nicodemus did it because he was stuck in religion, but Jesus came to him that night and said, you must be born again. You understand what I'm talking about? You see? You see? That John 3 where God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. You know where we get that scripture from? His conversation with Nicodemus. Nicodemus said, if you're going to talk to me and give jewels like that, that the church still using 2,000 years ago, ain't no money in my pockets, huh? It's, it's not worth to bury you the right way. Gave that brother a half a million dollar uh, a funeral service. I'm telling you, man. The tithe is the minimum. In the New Testament, they give in a whole nother way because of how good Yahshua is. And I'm telling you this to prepare you. Don't put a cap on what God can do for you. The tithe is just the start. Come on, give y'all some praise up in here. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Look at Acts 34 right quick in the NLT. I'm going to show you another example of New Testament giving. Hallelujah. It says, there were no needy people among them in the church because those who own land or houses would sell the land or houses and bring the money to the apostles to give to those in need. Is that pastor saying that? No, that's the Bible. The Bible was saying that. You say, pastor, I'm having trouble with the tithe. That's, that's, that's the minimum. Them people had houses and land overflowing. 
And when the church needed something, huh? because that's what happened. You see, in Acts, believers was being persecuted, and believers was hungry. Believers didn't have nothing to eat. And so people like Barnabas, we're going to see, they sitting there, and they not in that needed situation. They got real estate properties. And so them dudes look at the need of the church, and they looked at what they had, and they say, no, we not going to let the church need while we bless. Mm. People were selling extra land, selling extra houses. And listen, not giving a tenth, no. Not giving a tenth. Look at the scriptures. Look at it. No, 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 no. They was bringing the money uh, to the apostles. Verse 36, for instance, there was Joseph, the one of the apostles nicknamed Barnabas, the son of encouragement. He was from the tribe of Levi and came from the island of Cyprus. He sold a field he owned and brought the money to the apostles. Not 10%, no. 100%. Oh, yeah, y'all, you look, you laugh here, look at it, say, choo. <laughs> y'all ain't heard that before. But I got to get you ready for it. I got to get you ready for it. Because I'm going to tell you, that's how the Gentile church is doing yet. Oh, no, the black church ain't doing that, but the Gentile churches, they've been giving houses to church. And they give houses to church and lands to church that's not even preaching the gospel. That people are not even really getting saved in. Huh? And if they could do that for their churches that's steeped in idolatry and false doctrine, how much more should we do that for the church that's bringing the true gospel and saving the soul? My pastor, how you know that this church saving souls? You saw how you was before you came here? You saw how you was before you came here? Well, the work is still going on. The work is still going on, but it's not just going on in Lafayette. It's going on in other cities. It's going on around the world because of YouTube and technology. You see, in, in Acts, the church needed to feed Christians regular food. We're we not like that in America right now. But the church still got needs. You know what the church need? The church need new locations. The church need is on radio station. The church need TV airtime. The church need to be able to get out to bring this message of Jesus out, this message that we the Hebrews out. The church need more books. The church need billboards and bigger sins. The church need those things. Why? To fulfill the Great Commission. The Bible tells us, huh, that we should go out and preach this gospel, huh, to the ends of the earth. How you going to get to the ends of the earth without no money? You understanding what I'm saying? You understanding what I'm saying? Huh? That's like me telling you to take your wife huh, to, to, to Australia. But I tell you to take her, but I don't give you nothing to take her with. I'm going to be like, okay, we're going we to go at the public library. We're going to go to the Australia public library. That's the kangaroos. There has to be provision to fulfill the vision. And where does the provision come from? The provision comes from the people of God. You got to get that in your mind. I'm going to bring you, amen, to Exodus. And this is off script. Sambu, follow me to Exodus 25. Follow me to Exodus 25. This is off script. But just follow me there. Amen. Exodus 25. What I'm telling you is a whole nother level of giving. It's not the tithe, amen, it's the offering. It's a whole nother level. All right, you gotta be a different person to be in this class of people right here. It's giving above the tithe, all right? It's giving above the tithe, and people do it. In Exodus 25, amen, uh, verse one, we are gonna see the Lord telling his people about the tabernacle, the first actual church. The tabernacle. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, just follow me, keep going. Speak unto the children of Israel, that they bring me an offering. Of every man that giveth it willingly with his heart, you shall take my offering. And we're going to get to that in a second. It can't be by compulsion. You got to do it because God move on your heart. All right? All that locking the doors and sweating your eyes. All right? 
That's not what it's about. And, 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 even, and even, amen, uh, I, I don't believe in money lines. I don't want to judge nobody, but I don't believe in money lines. I don't believe everybody that's given a thousand stand right here. Because I think that, I think that the motive to give be different. The motive to give is just to stand in the thousand dollar line. And you just want to be seen. And I've seen some ninja stand in a thousand dollar line and only give fifty dollars. They just <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? They just won't stand that. First lady, I'm lying. That's how they do that. So it can't be for anything manufactured. This right here gotta be a work of God. You know, I'm just bringing you the scriptures, but I'm listen, I'm not pressuring you. And if I tell you anything that's against the Bible, please let me know. But, 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 but don't bring your worldly cultural view of money in the church and, and, and try to say that I'm wrong. I'm telling you what the Bible says, all right? Here, here, here we are, they just left the promised land. And God wants Moses to build the tabernacle, the Ark of the Covenant, the candlestick, all this stuff. Now this is God of all the universe. And God could drop these materials from heaven. Yes, he could, because in heaven, the streets made of gold. In heaven, the gates of pearl. In heaven, the foundations are 12 different stones, rubies, and diamonds. You understand what I'm saying? In my father's house or what? Many mansions. Heaven is rich. Heaven is rich. And God could fund his tabernacle himself if he want. But look what he says. He says, speak unto who? The children of Israel. That they bring who? Me an offering. Of every man that giveth it willing with his heart, ye shall take my offering. Keep on going, because this is getting good. And this is the offering which you shall take of them. Bring gold, silver, brass. Oh, that's a money church. No, that's God. That's God. Y'all getting mad when I'm asking for money for sheetrock. God telling the people, bring gold. <laughs> bring gold. Go through your jury box, God said. This is what God telling them. Am I lying? Look at verse 3. Huh? huh look. That was verse 3. Look at verse 4. Blue, purple, scarlet, fine linen. Go through your closets, he said. And bring me all the, all the linen and all the, all the expensive stuff that you got in your closets. I'm trying to build something, God said. Let's go to the next verse, verse 5. And ram skins, dyed red, banjo skins, and, and, and uh, 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 shit them wood. Huh? Go to verse 6. Got to watch how I say that. Oil for the light. <laughs> Spicy for anointing oil. Sweet incense. Everything that the church is going to need to operate. God is saying it ain't going to come from me. It's going to come from the people I just delivered out of Egypt. They thought they was coming out of Egypt with plenty to spend it on the club. But God said, you come out of Egypt with plenty to build my house. Look at verse 7. Come on, huh? Onyx stones, stones to be set in the ephah and the breastplate. Huh? Verse 8. And let them make a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. That's what it's about. That's what it's about. You're going to build it. And you're going to build it, hallelujah, so I could be there with you. So people can come and get saved. I look at all these cities that's out here and all these churches that's playing games and all these churches that's on the down low and all these churches that's just doing all manner of wickedness. You don't receive the emails that I receive. I sit up here like Paul in the book of Acts with his Macedonian vision where he had the vision of them people crying, don't leave us out. Come to Macedonia. And you got people, look, first lady, not lying, you got people from all over the country, come to California, come to Washington. What you have here, they begging for. You understand what I'm saying? They begging for. They begging for. And listen, listen, all the time I ask the Lord, Lord, just give it to me. That's what I asked him. I said, just give it to me. I got the law firm, got the real estate. You could make, listen, got property. You could let me hit the big one at any moment you want. Hallelujah. 
And so I pray to God. I said, God, just give it to me. Give me the billion right now. Listen, I'm going to do it all by myself. All right? I do it all by myself. But I feel in my spirit, God don't want me to do it by myself. He don't want me to do it by myself because he want to bless some other people too. Y'all ain't ready for me up in here. Y'all ain't ready for me up in here. He got some other sons that's real sons. Some other daughters that's real daughters. That's going to yoke their arms with mine and say, Pastor, you ain't got to do nothing by yourself. We going to supply for the tabernacle. And that's what it's all about. We're going to do this thing together and build this thing. That's what it's about. You're waiting for somebody else to do it. And when you was always supposed to do it. We get to the text in Exodus 36, verses 5 and 7, when Moses made the call. He said, listen, y'all come on and give. Hallelujah. I don't know what verse 9 says. I had verse 9. Go, go to verse 9 just to make sure. See if you could just click that right quick. According to all that short and pattern time. Yeah, that's good. Okay. Go to go to go to go to 36, 5. Go to 36. You see, because if the people know what they have to do, they're gonna do it. They're gonna do it. You know why they're gonna do it? Because they know his voice. And they know what's right. I'm up here, I ain't never say nothing that was wrong up in here, up in here. I'm, I'm trying to tell you right now. Just for the kingdom, man. Just, get, just to get the church back on track. And they spake unto Moses. So he had all the workers and, and all the people was bringing in. They was bringing in. They had got this revelation of offering and tithes. And, and they spake unto Moses saying, the people bring much more than enough for the service of the work which the Lord commanded to make. Go to verse 6. And Moses gave commandment, and they caused it to be proclaimed throughout the camp, saying, Let neither man nor woman make any more work for the offering of the sanctuary. So the people were restrained from bringing. Did you, did, uh, somebody caught that. When he told them what it was for, and he told them to offer, the Hebrews went in an uproar, and they began to bring everything. They brought so much that the people who was employed to work on the temples told Moses, Moses, you got to tell them people to stop. We got too much. I pray for a day when I come up in here. <laughs> I pray for a day when I come up in here. And I said, Malvo, you got to stop. Nigga Cole, you got to stop. Misha Roma, you got to stop. Don't you give another first lady? You got Lobardo, y'all got to stop. You done gave too much, Minister Ann. Y'all done listen. Y'all, you, could you imagine? Huh? Them people, no alarm. We not done yet. You. That's what happened when Moses showed the people of God. Huh? The gifts of tithes and offerings and what it's really about. What it's really about to build a place where God can be with his people. It's a partnership that God offers you. A partnership that if you accept, when you get to glory, listen, some of you men, you ain't never been a part of nothing great. Some of you, you've been looked over all your life. Some of you, they ain't never thought you was going to be anything or do anything. Some of you, they still don't believe in to this very day. You see? But I want to tell you that there's a God that believes in you. All right? And he knows what he has put in you. It's a gift, it's an opportunity, it's a power to get wealth. And you sit here and you say, man, if I was a part of this movement, part of that movement, you sitting in a movement. You sitting in the movement. It's the last days and God is about to come back. You understand what I'm saying? And I believe in my spirit that this is the very last awakening that the earth is going to see. 
I believe when this other generation of evangelists just passed away, these Gentile generation evangelists like Billy Graham, they done passed away, we have entered into a new dispensation. It's a dispensation, hallelujah, that tells us we're in the fourth quarter. We're not only in the fourth quarter, it's the two-minute warning. Anybody hear me up in here? All right? And the gospel is going to have to go out like it ain't never went out before. All right? This message of us, hallelujah, being the real people, is going to have to go out like it never went out before. Any movement is going to take a people whose heart is aligned with the church so much, huh? Where they don't see their material wealth as they own to spend on Buddha and crackling. You see? But they see their material wealth as a blessing from God to fund the movement to save the lost souls of men and women. I'm praying that God will deposit that in Philadelphia Lafayette. In the name of Jesus. Come on, give him some praise up in here. Hallelujah, because he's doing it in the Gentile churches. They're they giving away houses. Listen, they're doing legacy donations. I told you about that. They're going to get life insurance policies, man. When they know that their family is taken care of, they're getting life insurance policies, man. You see? They're doing it for the church, man. And we got people in here that sell life insurance, amen. If you sell life insurance in here, raise your hand. Come on, anybody. If you sell life insurance, we're going to put your little table out there next week. Amen. Hallelujah. I see you back there. Anybody else? Anybody? Raise it up high. Raise it up high. Because listen, all our men of God in here, you should have life insurance for, you, for your children and your wife. That's number one. That's number one. Woman of God, you got to have life insurance for, for, for your children. Huh? But after that, listen, I wouldn't, be, I wouldn't be mad at you if you did like them Gentiles. Huh? And you took out a little policy. You say, I might not be here when we get to the promised land. But I'm going to fund some people to be able to get that. Anybody hear me up in here? They say, that pastor crazy. No, I'm not crazy. I'm not crazy at all. I'm keeping it real with you. I'm telling you what we going to need to get to this next level. All right? All right? That's what we going to need. All right? Hallelujah. The tithe is just the minimum. Now, listen, let me finish off with point number three. Y'all still up? All right, let's look at Paul's principles. First lady, I'm all right? Yes, sir. All right, my timer went off, but I'm in overtime right now. All right, Paul's principles. Anybody all right? Y'all okay up in here? All right, Paul's principles. Because I got to teach you something. The tithe is the minimum. We talk about this offering, amen, and, and, and New Testament examples of giving above and beyond, but you're not going to do that and not be blessed. You're not going to do that and not be blessed. I promise you. If you're looking at New Testament advice on giving, Paul in 2 Corinthians gives us the game. Paul is standing on business. Not business, business. All right? In this epistle, and we're going to go through it a little bit, 2 Corinthians 8, 1 in the New Testament. Let's just look at it. Just, just read with me. Paul says, now I want you to know, dear brothers and sisters, what God in his kindness has done through the churches in Macedonia. They are being tested by many troubles, and they are very poor. But they are also filled with abundant joy, which has overflowed in rich generosity. Isn't that amazing? Paul said this church in Macedonia has many troubles, and they are very poor. But at the same time, we see something opposite happening. They poor, but they have abundant joy. They poor, but they are rich and generosity. This is a precept that we need to swallow up right quick. You can't wait until everything lined up to give to God. You can't wait till all your debt is paid. You can't wait until all everything, well, well we want to give, but we got these bills. Listen, if you don't give, you're going to always have those bills. All right? They wait, well, I, I still got this call note. Call note? People dying and going to hell today. But you're worried about your Isuzu pickup truck. Your rodeo, your pathfinder. You worried about that? I'm trying to say it. You see? They poor. They don't even have a lot. But look what they're doing. They rich in generosity. Don't wait till you get it. All right? Don't wait till you give it. Get it. Give it now. Look what he says. Hallelujah. 
uh, verse 3, for I can testify that they gave not only what they could afford, but far more. And they did it of their own free will. It's not a forced thing. We're going to show you the scripture. You're going to go home. You're going to think about this. You're going to pray about this. God going to give you, hallelujah, what you can do and what he want to do for you. Not by compulsion, not by locking doors, not by money lines. We ain't patting nobody down at the altar. You ain't got to hide your money in your shoe. <laughs> Nothing like that. I done been in them places. You ain't got to do that. All right? Verse 6, but we have urged Titus who encouraged your giving in the first place to return to you and to encourage you to finish this ministry of giving also. He's talking to the Corinthian church. He says, hallelujah, hallelujah. He says, I'm sending Titus to encourage you to give, Paul says. Verse 7, he says, since you excel in so many ways in faith, you have gifted speakers, you have knowledge, you're diligent and enthusiasm, and you love from us. He says, I want you to excel in this gracious act of giving also. This is good. Because sometimes we could think we mature. I know my Bible. I lay hands on people. I'm a healer. Uh, oh, yeah, I, I know how to preach. But you don't know giving? You don't tithe? You don't know nothing about no offering? Yeah, you mature at all these other level, other, other things, but you a baby in this. You're a baby in this. And that's why Paul's saying, listen, I want you to excel in all areas. Paul's saying in, in, in faith, speaking, knowledge, but what? But in this gracious act of giving as well. We got some people in this church. Listen, I'm telling you, you could be a minister, deacon, or pastor in all other areas. But your giving, your giving is, is whoo, whoo, goo, ga, ga. You a child in that. Because you can't see you giving God when your numbers don't add up. You, 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 you budget. You can't squeeze a Tootsie Roll in that budget. You, oh, no, babe. Oh, no, no snacks today. No. But you don't have the faith to see yourself giving something to God and him breaking through and coming out for you and providing for you. That's, that's, that's baby faith. I got a few claps for a year. Yeah, 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 yeah. He said, I want you to excel in this gift of giving. Uh, listen, in verse 8, I speak not by commandment, but by occasion of the forwardness of others. Paul says, and to prove the sincerity of your love. Paul said, our giving proves how real our love is. Mm -hmm. They got a lot of people that's going to say, oh, I love the church. I love this. I love you, Jesus. <laughs> huh? But I'm saying like the old songwriter said, oh, oh, hymn writer said, how deep is your love? <laughs> Bono. I better, I, I might get in trouble. Wait up. <laughs> because some of y'all love with your mouth, but you ain't loving with your pocket. And it's with our pocket that we really show if our love is real. I promise you. I promise you. Because where your treasure is, that's where your heart going to be. Yeah. Once you say, I love, I love. You ain't loving nothing. Because what you love, you're going to give money to. Oh, yeah, woman of God, when you, when you see that man break bread with you, oh, he love you. He love you. Baby. You understand what I'm saying? Woo! At that last marriage conference when Isaac was down on one knee through that, through them hundreds like that, I said, oh, he love. She got him now. I said, LaShonda got him now, baby. He ain't never threw no money on me like that. <laughs> Why? Because you can't love without giving. Black people, where you at? Where you at? You don't forgot how to love. Because all you want to do is take. All you want to do is something for free. You're so willing for God to love you, but you don't forgot how to love God. 
I asked you this morning, how deep is your love? Yeah. Dun, dun. Now don't go listen to that all day after this one. I give you a liberty to listen to three minutes of that, but go get out of that. End up cutting up. Do you love me? All right, listen. Oh, I'm sweating up here. Tell me. I right, listen. All right. So listen. Yeah, yeah. He said, prove the sincerity of your love. That's what Paul said about giving. That's what Paul said. I promise you, if we pull up your tithing report for 2023. What would it say about your love for this house? What would it say about your love for the work of God? You know? If we pull that up. If we went to the cash app, you know cash app, dude. We just, we just pull up your name, it's going to show. What is going to show? Huh? What is going to show? He says in verse 9, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know how much he loved you. Though he was rich in heaven and glory, streets of gold, throne, seated at the right hand of the Father, yet for your sakes, he became poor. Come down, became a carpenter. That you, through his poverty, might become rich. You won't give him nothing, but he gave everything for you. 2 Corinthians 8.10. So Paul say in 10, here's my advice. It would be good for you to finish what you started. Last year, you were the first one who wanted to give. And you were the first to begin doing it. Now you should finish what you started. Look at your neighbor and say, finish what you started. You're making all kind of promises. I promise. I said. He said, let the eagerness you showed in the beginning be matched now. By your giving. Give in proportion to what you have. Paul said, finish what you started. And Paul said, when you give, understand that something is going to follow your giving. And this is the good part. But I'm going to tell you, you know, if he don't do anything else for us, Randy, that he worthy of our gifts, he don't even have to have this part that I'm about to talk about because he done did enough already. But look what he said. Look how good he is. In 9, 6, he says, but this I say unto you, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly. You know, sowing is when we give, when we plant. All right? And, 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 and that's the way it goes is, is sowing and reaping. And God set a law in the heavens and creation that until the end of the age, there's always going to be seed time and harvest time. Meaning when you give something, when you plant something, there's a natural law of return that's going to come. It goes like this. Whatsoever a man sow it, that shall he reap. And it's in everything. It's in everything. It's in every kind as well. So he's saying this. If you sow sparingly, if you just give a little bit, you're going to reap sparingly, you're going to get a little bit. In the NLT it says, remember this, a farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop. You're not getting an acre of okra if you plant three seeds of okra. You'd be a fool to come in the backyard the next week saying, where are my okra? You just put three seeds in the ground. And God is saying, you expecting all that from me. And you putting a dollar, two dollar, I done gave you what you gave. Since you've been sowing sparingly, you're going to reap sparingly. But the good news is, but he that soweth bountifully. Oh! If you give generously, you shall also reap generously. In the NLT it says, but the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. You're only going to get from God in proportion to what you give. Yeah. The more you sow, the more you will reap. Come on, give y'all some praise up in here. <laughs> Woo. Woo. 
That's the law of God. I ain't making up nothing up in here. I'm telling you what Paul said. I'm doing a little more than reading. That's all I'm doing. But watch the balance as he talk about sowing and reaping. Once again, keep it in your heart. 9-7. But every man according as he purposed in his heart. It's, what about, it's about the work of God on you. Listen, if you don't feel like giving, don't give a single cent. If you don't think that God is worthy, don't give a single cent. If you don't think that the souls of men is worth it, don't give a single cent. If you're not comfortable in this church, huh, don't give a single cent. If you don't believe the gospel and you're not saved just yet, don't give a single cent. Because obviously something ain't happening you yet. If he don't have your heart yet, how can we expect him to have your wallet? I would dare say don't give a single penny until you feel in your heart that God is worthy of it. I'm just saying. He said, listen, every man according as he purposed in his heart, let him give. Listen, not grudgingly, not reluctantly. You ain't coming to the orphan back, all right, Pat. <laughs> not reluctantly. Huh? And look what he says, not of necessity, not by pressure or compulsion. Ain't nobody pressuring you up in here. I done been in some church where the pastor watch close. Some of y'all was at that church. They watch close. And then they tell, listen, it tripped me out. Because I was tripping up in there because the pastor he was watching close from the pulpit and he told the people, ah, don't come up in here like this. He said, open your hand. He wanted to see what they was giving him. Oh, that chain coming in here with nickels and corn. He would tell him, open your hand. First lady, I'm lying. We ain't doing that up in here. We ain't doing that up in here. Every one of y'all that come up in here, I'm saying a hundredfold blessing upon you. A hundredfold blessing upon you. It's not grudging, it's not of necessity. Why? For God love it. A cheerful giver. God wants you to be coming up in here, boy. Look, coming up to that thing, boy. Hey! You got to be happy while, while you're coming up in here. I, you know, I got some videos of some people dancing in church that understand this. I was going to play, but I just, I, 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 I come, I, listen, I come, we rushing the kid here. But, so, but I want you all to go look up people dancing during offering time. All right? Hallelujah. And you're going to see people. I done seen a man a centipede his way down the aisle. <laughs> he up in that ball, a centipede his way all the way down the aisle, and he's going to give. And listen, and I'm going to tell you why people, why, why people should be cheerful. One, they, they wouldn't have anything without God. They wouldn't have anything. See, when I think about myself and how I grew up and where I come from, the houses we used to live in and where God got me right now, you see, sometimes we, we looking at what other people have and we could be just murmuring and complaining. I got another word coming on me about murmuring and complaining. That's a whole other thing. But, but sometimes we could look out so much until we don't look back. And sometimes you got to look back to see where God brought you from. The, the home you used to live in, the, 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 the bologna sandwiches you used to eat, the, the wooden floor where the air come through that you used to, the floor that you used to sleep on. And, and, and when they had your bed, you had to share with three other people. And push up, Tasha. Push up, Tyson. <laughs> Taking a bed with a tub. Ain't got ain't no sprinkle tub up in here. That tub shitting off the floor. You know when you put hot water in there, that water turned cold quick. You got to get in that tub say, don't run it yet. Get in that Come, Okay, run it now, run it now. Ring around that tub that don't go away. You can't have them scrubbing bubbles. You needed Ajax back in the day to get that off. You up in there throwing that powder, trying to stick the powder to the side of the thing. How much? Come up in there like you just bake a pound cake. Look, hey, Jackson, you have. That's the struggle. But look at you now. Look how you're living now. You're in that standing shower. Look. You spraying up in there. Ooh, honey. Ooh. But you can forget what God done did for you. But. But if you just take your time and count your blessings every now and then. 
You ain't gonna be coming to that basket all great. You're gonna be cheerful. Look what the Lord has done. You could be a cheerful giver, hallelujah, when you recognize that he deserves our tithes and offerings. You deserve it. And you can be cheerful to know, hallelujah, when you come and give because he is about to bless you even more when you give to him. Hallelujah. Come on, give him some praise. Hallelujah. I'm winding on down the best I can. Now, according to the law of the harvest, the kind that you plant is usually the kind that you are going to reap, all right? Um, and that's the usual way that agriculture works. When you plant orange seeds, you get orange trees. When you plant apple seeds, you get apple trees, huh? When you plant uh, okra, you get okra. You, when, you, when you plant watermelon, you get watermelon. Somebody getting hungry up and I'm feeling a hunger anointing. I'm feeling a hunger anointing. And usually, you have to understand that in tithes and offerings, when you sow money, all right, God is going to give you money in return. That's the way it goes. Is the kind you plant is what you're going to receive. But God places something special on the tithe and on the offering. He allows it to break that natural chain of sowing kind and reaping kind. He breaks that supernaturally. And Paul says in here, attesting and corroborating to this supernatural thing. He says about giving in the same chapter, after you give, after you sow bountifully, you're going to reap. He says, and God is able. Anybody know that God is able? Yes. Say, God is able. He's able. He said, to make, watch this, all grace abound towards you. He's talking about giving in 8 and 9, and he's saying that when you give, hallelujah, he's just not going to allow you to return the same kind. Yeah, you're going to get, you give money, you're going to get money back, but he's saying what you're going to get back when you tithe, when you offer, he says he is able to make not just money grace return, he says all grace is going to abound to you. Pastor, what's grace? It's favor. When you tithe and offer, you're just not going to get money favor. You're going to get job favor. You're going to get business favor. You're going to get marriage favor. You're going to get children favor. You're going to get family favor. You're going to get health favor, legal favor, get out of jail free card favor. You're going to get spiritual favor, deliverance favor. That's the kind of favor God's talking about. Times and offerings opens doors, hey God, that no man can shut. And it's all kind of favor you can get by giving unto God. He says about this chapter, and God is able when you give to make all grace, watch this, abound towards you. That word abound means to overflow. It means to give you more than what you need. We have a French word up in here, Louisiana, that's the word lanyap, all right? God is about to make all kinds of favor abound Overflow be line you up right in your lap. Come on, give y'all some praise up in here. It's a spillover thing that you, because you're giving, will always have all sufficiency in all things. You hear all them alls? Huh? All grace. Always. All sufficiency in all things. I don't know about you, but I'm into all of that. Anybody hear me up in here? All right. When you give the all grace and all abound in favor of God will allow you to always have enough, always have all sufficiency in all things. Everything you do, God's going to meet you because heaven, a word is going to go out. Hallelujah. A tither needs something. A giver needs something. And all heaven is going to come to your rescue. He says, you always have all sufficiency. You always have enough. You always have what you need that you may abound in every good work. Every time you try to do something good, God is going to make you be able to do that thing and even more so. Hallelujah. You're not only going to have enough for yourself, you're going to have enough for the people around you. Come on, give y'all some praise <laughs> up in here. I just want to say that there's some people that's offended by this word. And the ones that are, I want you to check their bank statement. And I want you to check their job going. And I want you to check how they're living. And before you be offended by a word on giving, check if the way you're doing it is working for you. 
Yeah, be bad up in here. You talking about that again? Yeah, because I'm trying to get you blessed. Amen. You're going to stay unemployed. You're going to stay borrowing. You're going to stay moved from pillar to post until you change your mind on how God's world works. Brother Israel, I'm going to need a little help getting out of here. I'm making myself a little too comfortable. <laughs> Hallelujah. Look at 2 Corinthians 9, 10. He says, now he, that's God, that ministers, gives seed to the sower, all right? God is the one that gives seed to the sower, meaning that every time you give, you, you, you a sower. You out there just blessing the people of God, blessing the church of God. You a sower. And what's going to happen is that bucket is never going to go empty because God ministers seed. He gives seed to those who are sowing. If you ain't got no seed, it means that you're not sowing. Because our God, he's the one that ministers seed to the sower. Huh? He, he's going to both minister bread for your food, meaning that he's going to always put food on your table. And he's going to multiply your seed that's sown. All right? Meaning that what you give, huh? He's going to multiply that. You're going to get, hallelujah, not addition, you're going to get multiplication back. If you done sold one, it's going to be time five, time 10, time 20, time 30, time 100. This is the promises of God. And the Bible says that God is not a man that he should lie. He's going to multiply your seed sown and increase the fruit of your righteousness. I love this right here. Because giving is a righteous thing. When you give, hallelujah, heaven takes note of it. When you give, hallelujah, something happens in heaven. Whenever you give on earth, God increases your account in heaven. That's why he said, don't store up riches on earth where moth and rust corrupt, where thieves break in and steal. No, he says, store up treasure where? In heaven. In heaven, where moth and rust don't corrupt, where thieves can't break in and steal, but it's reserved unto God until the day of judgment. What does that mean? Everything you give to God and his work on judgment day. When we all stand in that bowl and Chris, hallelujah, y'all in the line, we waving at y'all, me first lady in the line. We happy because we know we under the blood. Our eternal destination is not in question, but just our position in the kingdom is in question. We get up there, boy, and God opened the books on Bo and Chris. And he said, okay, y'all under the blood. Y'all going in. Hallelujah. We like, oh, yeah, Chris, y'all going in. Thank you, Jesus. And then he said, well, let me look at y'all works of righteousness that y'all done did. One of the things that God going to look at is how much you sown to his work. How much you sown to his kingdom. And he going to look at every cent that you done gave on earth. He going to trade that money on earth to open you an account in heaven. That's why he says store up riches in heaven. Huh? Huh? I want to ask you, how's your account doing in heaven this morning? You going to be broke when you get to glory? May he increase the fruits of your righteousness. See, what I want from you is when we all in that line, that God going to read that amount that you gave, and I'm going to shout. And I'm going to say, God, yes, they did. And they gave it, some of it, most of it, to Philadelphia Christian Church. And God, we brought that gospel to Brooklyn. We brought it to Tampa Bay. We brought it to Michigan. We brought it in, in, in Chi-Town where they were killing everybody. And when we brought that gospel, the city was changed. Revival happened and the guns were put down. Revival happened and the people say, we the people. God, we took that money, hallelujah, and we rented out, hallelujah, the Superdome. And we gave a revival, God, hallelujah, that brought people out of the projects in New Orleans. They came out of Third Wall. They came out of Ninth Wall. They came from everywhere, God. We rented it out. We packed it out. Hallelujah, God. I'll be up in there shouting. I'm going to say, listen, 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 that ain't your job. Be quiet. Be quiet, Omar. I see it all written down. And he's going to reward, hallelujah,
God's people for that. Listen, let's read 2 Corinthians 9, 11, and then we're going to get out of here. Look what he said. Yes, you will be enriched in every way so that you can always be generous. He's going to make sure that you're getting riches from everywhere if you're generous so that you can always be generous. And when we take your gifts to those who need them, they will thank God for you. So two good things will result from your ministry of giving. The needs of believers in Jerusalem will be met, and they will joyfully express their thanks unto God. Could you imagine in all those cities, they're going to be thanking you and little Lafayette for providing that they might have churches in their cities. As a result of your ministry, they will give glory to God for your generosity to them. And to all believers, will prove that you are obedient to the good news of Christ. And they will pray for you with deep affection because of the overflowing grace of God that has been given to you. Thank God for this gift. Too wonderful for words. Too wonderful for words. Come on, give y'all some praise up in here. <laughs> Hallelujah. Ushers, ushers, can you bring the baskets, amen? Hallelujah. I've gone over my time, amen, but, but it was worth it. Hallelujah. It was worth it. It was worth it. It was worth it. It was worth it. We talked about the tithe being the minimum. Hallelujah. Uh, 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 uh. We also gave you some New Testament examples of giving, and then we took you to Paul's principles in 2 Corinthians and just read what New Testament giving looks like. Amen. So listen, while you're prayerful and Seeking the most high. You know what your minimum is, the tithe, but also be asking, Lord, would, give me a number for offering, Lord. Give me what I should do to go over and above that tithe. And listen, like I always say, if you have a need, sow a seed. Because God can't lie. God can't lie. He's always going to bless his people. Listen, they're giving already. Hallelujah. On the cash app. On the cash app. I, I don't want to stop you. Worship team, come on up. Hallelujah. And once again, don't come up here with no booth in your mouth like God not worthy. And I ain't going to be watching your hand at all, but just <laughs> come with an appreciation for what he's done for us. Philadelphia is offering time. Hallelujah. 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 I see you. Tiffany LeBard has given. Hallelujah. Hundredfold blessing. George Demichet has given. Hundredfold blessing on you. Hundredfold blessing. Hundredfold. Hundredfold. That's right, brother Ken. That's right. <laughs>
give God some praise in this house. Hallelujah. I see you, Roger, find that they're giving. They're giving, they're giving. Hallelujah. Stretch out your hands and we're going to pray a, a special blessing over this offering. Amen. I see you, Miss Suzanne. Bless you a hundredfold. Hallelujah. Stretch out your hands right now. Amen. And we're going to pray a blessing. Hallelujah on all the givers. And one of our founding members, Miss Suzanne. Amen. Donato. God, we thank you for the givers that's given in the baskets and those that's given in the boxes and those that's given online and on Cash App. Now, God, we pray that you would make all grace abound towards them, that in all things they would have all sufficiency, God, all sufficiency, all sufficiency to do every good work. We pray that your favor of healing be upon Miss Suzanne, God, and healing on every other person who's given, O King, uh, to your message, God. We pray that the favor of good marriages, the favor of healthy children, the favor of, of health in their body, the favor, God, of, of good jobs, the favor of businesses, the favor of investments, God, the favor of, of, of interest-bearing accounts to, to, to just shock the world, God, the favor of great returns and great yields, God. We pray for favor and promotions, God. Let all grace abound to your people, even now. We pray for the hundredfold blessing, and we thank you for this partnership that we have with you. And we thank you, God, that you're going to take these monies, God, and you're going to continue to build houses of worship all over this country and all over this world. And when we get to glory, we pray that you remind your people, God, of the good work they've done on earth when they get to heaven. It's in Jesus' mighty, wonderful name we pray. And the church say, amen, amen, amen. Come on, give him some praise in this house. Hallelujah. Glory to the most high God. Now, saints, listen, we never like to leave without giving a little altar time. And I know, hallelujah, that it, it, we doing it a little, little different, but that's just the way it is. It don't take away from nothing. Hallelujah. Uh, 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 if, if everybody in the house, if you could stand to your feet even now, everybody in the house, amen, just stand to your feet. Amen. And if you need the altar for anything, anything, if you're ready to make a vow to God, if you want to talk to him about how good he's been to you, if, if it's not about tithing at all or giving at all, maybe it's about the eternal destination of your soul. You heard the gospel in the message. You heard it. It's all about his righteousness being imputed on us. And if you're here, amen, and you want to be saved, amen, you can come to this altar and be saved. If you're a believer and you want to talk to God and get some things right between you and him in your heart, you can come to the altar and do that. If you're one of them people, amen, that want to be like Nicodemus, Joseph, like Mary, and, and something touch you in here when I talked about it, People partnering with God to do great things for God. Forget about being known on earth. What about being known in, in heaven? Some of you are going to talk with your God and make a deal with your God at this altar. That he do something special through you so that you could fund the kingdom. I'm going to get out your way, but listen, if you need this altar, come on here right now in the name of Yahshua. Come on. Come on up, come on up. You want the Lord to overflow in your life? You want the Lord to do it for you? Come on, come on. You need to talk to him about salvation? Come on. You need to talk to him about sanctification? Come on. Listen, hallelujah. He's ready to do it. 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 He's looking for some kings and queens to pour into. He really is. He really is. Come on, we just got to ask him to overflow. We just got to ask him to overflow. We got to have him, ask him to have his way. Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. We want it. We want it. Have it. Have it.
now, amen. Holy Spirit just wanted me to tell you, amen. He was waiting for you to be at this place right here. He couldn't let it work out the way that you wanted it to work out just yet because you weren't ready. But you're ready now. You know what it's for and you know what to do with it now. It's not really about you. It's about God. And you're going to enjoy it. You're going to have more blessings than enough. But you're going to know what to do with it now. You have an eternal perspective. You're going to pick up where God left off. For he came to seek and to save that which is lost. And all that giving the universities and all, that's all good. But ain't nobody going to heaven after they give all that. We got to put first things first. The Hebrews got to start giving back to the house of God. And you can find some other places to give after that. I want you to pray with me. Say, Most High God, we are ready for you to do what you've been wanting to do. I surrender everything that I have and all who I am. I'm ready to go to work for you all this time. I was doing it for me, but I'm ready to do it for you. So bless these hands. Bless these feet. Bless my mouth, my mind, my eyes. Bless my ideas. Have your way. I admit. I haven't been perfect, I haven't been but, you use but you use imperfect people. Imperfect people. I, give I give you permission. Use me. Use me. Every, gift. Every gift, every strength. Every strength. Help, me bring you glory. Help me bring you glory and save souls. Save souls. I believe in you. I believe in you. You died for me. You were buried for me. You rose for me. Save me. Forgive me. Wash me clean. And I'll never forget it. I'll always honor you. And give you what you deserve. In Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, give him some praise up in here. Come on, give it to him. Give it to him. Hey! Come on, come on, give it to him.